Hi, this is Jazz Obrecht, and welcome to my Talking Guitar Podcast with John Renborn. This one is really special to me for two reasons. First, it was the very first in-person interview I ever did with a musician. And second, I was such a big fan of John Renborn's music. When I was in grade school and high school, I became very interested in acoustic guitar. And uh, the first song that really turned my head around was Yorma Kalkinen's Embryonic Journey on the second Jefferson Airplane album. And then I heard Jimmy Page's uh, beautiful acoustic guitar playing on the first Led Zeppelin album, a song called Babe, I'm Gonna Leave You. And a few, not long after that, my mother and I were driving around in Detroit somewhere, and I was listening to the FM radio, and it was beautiful, beautiful acoustic guitar song came on that was in the old English style. And the uh, DJ announced that that was John Renborn. So I pleaded with my mother to stop off at Dearborn Music on the drive home, and I ran in and bought a copy of that album, which is called Sir John A Lot. And to this day, I count it among my top 10 favorite guitar albums. A few words about who John is. A contemporary of Bert Yanch and Davy Graham, John began his acoustic guitar journey in the early 1960s. He had a superlative technique, and what also set him apart was his unique stylistic fusion of British folk music, Renaissance-type songs, modern jazz, ragtime, skiffle, classical, and American country blues. Combining all these led to his becoming one of Great Britain's foremost acoustic guitarists. His solo albums of medieval-style playing his duets with Bert Yanch and Stefan Grossman, and his five years' work with Pentangle all share the same characteristic. Innovative, lyrical playing executed with a finesse that makes his style instantly recognizable. What an extraordinary player. Our interview took place in Berkeley, California, at the home of Ed Denson, the owner of Kicking Mule Records, on the morning of June 1, 1978. Before we got started, John, in his typically gracious way, cooked me breakfast. Here's the audio of the conversation that followed. Well, John, I guess we better start at the beginning. Okay. Right. Okay. Uh, tell me about Torquay or Torquay in the oh, summer I see. of '62. <laughs> All the way back there. Yeah. Um, I want to give as uh, complete a story as I can. About yeah. You, you know, so I don't have to. Oh, actually, that takes a lot to think of all that. But, um, well, I think that was probably either when I was just about to. I was still at school. I think at art school mm-hmm. or before then, even. And uh, I remember just meeting a lot of people that played folk guitar, Brunton, and that's uh, more or less how I started playing that sort of stuff. When did you first start playing guitar? Um, well, I had one when I was about 14, 13 or 14, so that's, I'm 33 now. <laughs> <laughs> um, what do you remember about it? Uh, let me think. I think it went in various stages of, of I generally had a guitar because there was a craze on at the moment of having a guitar. Roy Rogers, of course, was very popular as a <laughs> cowboy. Could, could shoot red Indians out of trees and that sort of thing. Um, I think it probably went along with the cowboy suit. Oh, yeah. Um, and then after that, there was the, a skiffle craze. Mm-hmm. And it's Lonnie Donegan? Yeah. Yeah. And so everyone had to have a guitar for that one. So that was about how it started, you know. Do you remember anything about the first guitar? Anything peculiar? Um, it was called a Wonder guitar, was mm-hmm. the make, and it was pink. <laughs> At, uh, that's about all. Uh-huh. Steel string? Yeah. Uh-huh. No. When did you uh, first started to study music? In school, I took it in as a a subject. 
Was this like a, our equivalent of high school? No, it'd be the equivalent of a, a high schools later on, isn't it? Is it grades but, nine through twelve? Yeah, up until this is like up until the age of fifteen, sixteen, mm-hmm. just before school leaving O levels. Mm-hmm. So I, I'd, I'd been playing guitar, very much skiffle and different things, you know, for fun, mm-hmm. you know, up until then. And then I took music as an exam as one of the subjects, and I took had to then have classical lessons. Mm-hmm. So I had a couple of years of classical lessons and. What school was this at? This was a school in Guildford. What was the name? George Abbott. George Abbott? Mm. In Guildford? Mm. How do you spell Guildford? <laughs> this is ridiculous. <laughs> I hope you don't want, There's so many people that are interested in this stuff. No. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You'd be surprised, you know. Especially people in Guildford. <laughs> that would ever read. <laughs> okay, uh... Mm. When did you first get involved with bands, or with groups, I should say? Um, I think... Uh, well, I went from the school to arts, art college. You know, I wasn't there for very long. And uh, when I came out of art college, or well, before that, you know, since going to school, I used to play in various little folk clubs and things like that. And a solo make, act? Um, yeah, I think. And no, I should play with somebody else, a 12 string player. Um, and then there was a R and B craze. The, blues boom yeah and then I used to play in blues type bands Hogsnort Rupert yeah and the famous orchestra yeah and that was you know was that basically a blues type band yes it was it was that very much like all the other English bands we used to do Jimmy Reed and if you know it became more adventurous Ray Charles <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know imagine what it was like yeah <laughs> shocking what were you playing at the time in that band? Well, I borrowed an electric guitar for that one. I can't remember what it was called. Okay, where did you progress from uh, Hog Snort? Um, well, after that, I moved up to London. Not, I don't think, for any real reason. Not particularly a musical reason. Anyway, I started to play in some of the London clubs called the the Black Horse, um, and uh, the Roundhouse, um, and generally met a lot more people up there. You know. Are you playing acoustic now? Yeah. Is that where you met Bert? Mm. That's right. Can you tell me about your meeting? Yeah, I've, I was just thinking about that. I used to have a scarf guitar then. Mm-hmm. S C A R T H, mm-hmm. um, and that's the, what I used on some of the my first record anyway. And I used to know a few people. I went to art school in Kingston, and there used to be a place down there, an old boat which had folk music on, folk barge type place. Um, I used to meet a few people around there, who said you must try and hear Bert. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, Don wants you to give him a call. He must hear Bert and Davy. You know, Davy was a legend as well. Um, Davy Graham. Yeah. And surprisingly enough, I first heard Davy when he was playing with John Mayle in the sort of early form of the John Mayle band. Ah. And he, by that time, was not really playing acoustic. Well, he was playing a Gibson with a pickup, but blues type. It was this was like the R and B thing, yeah. you know? but he'd actually yeah. made Angie and all, all like the Train Blues and like before that period, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so when I first got to see him, he actually wasn't playing that music anymore, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, but uh, I went up to hear Bert playing, and he was playing in bungees. And uh, in actual fact, I think the first time I heard Bert, he was playing with Little Wolf. Do you remember? Little mm-hmm. Little Little player. Yeah, and that was astounding, you know. And, uh, it was, you know, I've never heard guitar playing as good as that before. So how did your collaboration come about? 
Um, well, through actually looking for a place to live, it turned out that Bert had somewhere the way he was living, there was room there, and I moved in there. So it came about that we were all living, I was living in a sort of house at various stages, you know, with Bert and other people. And then we started playing music at the same time. How did your, uh, how did each of your playing uh, influence the other, do you think? Well, I don't know if I influenced Bert very much, but he, you know, so I certainly got a lot from his playing. And, uh, more or less up up until that time, I think I've been doing, you know, the, of the various styles that I was playing, it would be a mixture of the people who'd come through England and I'd heard on record, like Jack Elliott and a bit of Brunsey and, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. the general folk basic thing, mm. trying to play in in an idiom, you know. And I think Bert was probably one of the first few people I heard who was playing creative music on the acoustic guitar that was, although it was drawn from basic, good traditional sources, <laughs> was nevertheless a, a music of his own, you know. Yeah. So he helped you evolve mm. and stuff? Yeah, and then I found that like, we used to, he'd be working on things and songs and I could, I'd had this small amount of music training at school, which I found it interesting to try and work parts out with on Bert's tunes, you know, mm -hmm. and think of them that way. And then we started doing some music, you know. What came after that? Um, was this, what year was this about? Well, this would be about the year of Bert's first record, I think. Mm -hmm. When is that? Is that sort of 64, is it? 64, 65. Yeah. It's when the Rolling Stones were just putting out their first album. Yeah. Around then? Yeah, I, as far as I can remember, yeah. <laughs> Mm. I just wrote about Joanne Kelly and she talked about that. Yeah. Mm. That period. Okay, uh, Pentangle came along a little after that? Yeah, quite a lot later. That was... Um, 67? Mm. Yeah, I'm really, I'm not really good on dates. But uh, we'd all, we all wound up playing in the same club at one stage. Danny and Terry used to play right. drums with Alexis Corner mm -hmm. and he used to sing down in this place and I and I knew Jackie from the days at Kingston before I met Bert and it was like the guy that used to play guitar with her told me to listen to Bert and all this. So it was one of those. What what um I have you playing in clubs with Bert and what came between then and your first album? How did your first album come about? Mm. Well, previous to that, I'd been playing with an American singer called Doris Henderson, and I'd done some tracks. She'd made a record, and I played guitar for her on that. And there were a few, I'd done a few bits of recording, I think, before meeting Bert. Um, Let me think. And then on one of Bert's records, I played second guitar on them. And then the record company, the same record company, asked me to do a record of my own. Which company was this? That was the Transatlantic Company. Yeah, and no. then, sorry, what were we talking about? The period what between <laughs> yeah, playing yeah. in the clubs and uh -huh. well, that went on for quite a long time. Then the various folk clubs, you know. Mm -hmm. What do you think playing in the, how do you think playing in clubs affected your style? Um, well, it, what I actually do, apart from my basic sort of style, is a folk mm -hmm. club style of playing, you know, yeah. that's it, you know. Yeah. I don't know very, anything very different from that. Yeah. What, uh, this was the time, you know, when the, the blues was starting to hit big and rock and roll was starting to, really pick up a lot of steam. What kept you in the folk realm? Um, oh, it's difficult to say. It's more 
coincidence, I think, more than anything else. I don't think it was particularly at that period that I was more drawn to that type of music. I really used to like playing in the in the blues band, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it was just generally the finances of actually working in a band was so difficult. Yeah. And it was just a lot easier to play, you know, look after yourself and play the guitar, yeah. you know. Did just you, that one, simple. Did you include, uh, include Elizabethan type stuff in your repertoire at this time? The contrapuntal? No, that's, I wasn't doing that at all. And that mm-hmm. was only... Um, um, let me think how I actually got back into that one. Because that was the sort of stuff that I was interested in when I was doing guitar lessons and doing music at school. Mm-hmm. Early music. And I think um, it was through eventually getting involved on the on the folk club circuit and hearing traditional music, English music and Irish and Scottish music, mm-hmm. that I started to think how to adapt these tunes, if I sung them myself, how would I make, wait, make a good accompaniment for them, mm. you know? And then I started to realise that a lot of them were on the same music, like modal scales, that the early music was, yeah? Mm-hmm. And therefore, it would be possible by using a, a system similar to, like, early music, you know, to work out accompaniments. Mm. And then, like, the two things started to, I started to get more interested in loop music and early part writing, you know, mm-hmm. which I was, you know, I'm still, that's really fine, you know, it's the type of music I like a lot. Would you, did you listen to a lot of the old composers? Um, or did you have favorite performers in that genre? Well, it, yes, let me think, I used to, the, the man is Guillaume de Mascha, G-U-I-L-L-A-U-M-E. <laughs> Guillaume. U M E. Yeah. D E. M A U C H A U T. Okay. I think that's correct. Right. And that's um, very early part writing um, before the sort of major and minor scales and the the. the correct harmonies came in, yeah? <laughs> yeah. It's very, it sounds very primitive, but in actual fact it's very, not at all, it's like a very complex mm-hmm. form of part writing, you know. And that's lovely stuff. And then there's, like, a lot later on, the lute composers and the versional composers, which transcribes well onto guitar. Oh, that's nice. And was that the foundation of Sir John a lot? More or less, yeah. Mm. Okay, what was But none of I'd like to point out that none of the, <laughs> none of the things that I, I do on the on the guitar and the lute style are particularly serious pieces of music. You know, oh, they're really? all light hearted, yeah. Mm-hmm. What uh, framework of mind are you in when you compose? Or um, which you, how do you compose? Well that's, I I'm not sure about that because I work on like the two systems. One is to get up every morning and actually go into the room and make myself work on a piece of music, which eventually does work, I think, you know, if you can actually stick to it. And the other one is to do nothing at all until something <laughs> something amazing occurs, you know, <laughs> and just wait for it to happen. And they're both okay, you know, they both work. Yeah. But, I mean, you cannot actually make yourself do it, I don't think, you know. Yeah. That's interesting. Um... Let's go back to uh, your first album. Mm-hmm. What was your initial reaction when you went into the studio and you finally had to cut an album? What were your feelings? Well, all the records at that time were done in such a um, an un-business-like way. Bert's records were generally done in his house or someone else's house with a tape recorder. Mm-hmm. And this one of mine, most of the tracks were done in a sort of basement studio in Denmark Street, and most of the people were drunk, and it was... In London? Yeah, it mm-hmm. wasn't done in a very, uh, you know, there wasn't any time to be worried about anything, you know? Yeah. But, I mean, the things, some of Bert's early things, I played on Jack Orion, one of his records, and that was done in his hallway, 
and the people upstairs were making so much noise <laughs> they had to be asked to come down and sit in the kitchen till he'd finished recording. Uh-huh. Most of those were done by a man called Bill Leader. Leader? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, what, anything else happened before Pentangle? Um, no, I don't think nothing, no big things, you know. Okay. When you were with Pentangle, what guitars did you use? Um, I think I started off playing the same J50 that I had when I was doing. Gibson? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And with a pickup. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, I found that that didn't, that wasn't particularly good sound wise. Then I've got a three three five, mm-hmm. and then I had basically a three three five type guitar till the end. You know. Yeah. Did you uh, did you think the three three five was was what you wanted? Well, I used to enjoy playing it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. When well, it wasn't, it was always a, a sounded like a quiet acoustic type band. You know. Mm-hmm. But I found that using something like a three three five had a Although it was, I used to play it finger style, but it had a nice even sound to it, and better from the acoustic guitar with the pickup, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Do you remember who made the pickup for the acoustic? It was just a Diamond, I think. Diamond? Mm. Okay. Um, would you mind talking about Pentangle a little bit? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, how demanding was it to uh, to be in a band like that? No, yeah, it was it was bad, and it was only demanding. I think when the when we had a very heavy work schedule on, which we frequently did, you know, mm-hmm. it started off by being a little jamming band in a pub in the back room. This is after we used to play in the cousins. We got a room of our own and, <laughs> and a, had a club, yeah. a horseshoe club. Yeah, yeah, you know, and so, and then it started to get more you know, into like touring and recording. But that was the hardest part for me, keeping up with the, the travel schedules, you know. Really? Mm. Did, did you find you had trouble writing when you were traveling? Well, it was it was another thing about the band. It Sometimes it had bursts of creativity and then periods of nothing happening at all, you know. Um, and towards the end, we'd all gone separate, lived in separate places. Terry, the drummer, was living in Menorca. Terry in Cox. Spain, yeah. Mm-hmm. Bert was living in Wales. Daddy was living somewhere else. You make it hard to and practice. It really got impossible in the end, you know. Mm-hmm. Do you ever see any of them? Yeah, but not very rarely. I mean, it's all just in town. If if I'm passing through town, maybe I see Bert or Dan. What What came after Penn? Oh, and Jackie, of course. I see Jackie a lot. Yeah. Yeah. What uh, What happened? Oh, you got Jackie to sing on another Monday. Yes, is that how right. you first met her? Yeah. Well, I used to know. I used to play guitar with her before then. Anyway, mm. she was part of the sort of South London crowd before I actually moved up to London itself. How did how did the actual forming of Pentangle take place? Like who 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 uh, initiated it and who well, brought in what members? Well, I think what happened was that Bert was then writing some slightly more interesting or like more slightly longer and more complicated kind of songs um, than we've been doing before and I think we'd started probably to listen to a lot of different groups by then and we decided it'd be nice to see what happened if we got like Danny and Terry and Jackie you know but it wasn't a matter of really sitting down and like saying we'll select these people you know yeah. I think we'd already I'd done a concert in London and Danny had played on it anyway, you know. So mm-hmm. we'd, we'd actually been making music with Danny as well up until that. Do you have any favorite uh, Pentangle albums or songs that you did to this day that are your favorites? Um, well, actually, I really I don't listen to them at all. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I heard some things in Japan that, were, you know, people were playing that, the Pentang stuff. It was nice to hear it again. I, I thought it sounded fine, you know. What What happened after uh, Pentangle? 
What did you do after Pentangle broke up? Um, well, nothing very much again. I was moving around and staying in different places. Mm -hmm. And was this in London? Well, actually, the yes, this was around in Canterbury and around that sort of area. Um, I made contact with a, an old friend of mine who, used to, who played flutes on The Lady and the Unicorn. Tony Roberts, and he was li then living down on a farm in Devon, and I think I drifted down there for a while and stayed with him, and then got a place near them, you know. And then I used to start, we started working together, and Jackie got involved in singing, and uh, a drummer, Kesh Sarte, and a uh, fiddle player, Sue Draheim. We got, got another small band together social band <laughs> but cottage industry <laughs> how do you spell Kesh Sarte? K-E-S-H-A-V Kesh uh -huh. S-A-T-H-E mm -hmm. okay in fact I'm sh I should actually have some records with me but I haven't got any uh, was this what was this about 73, 74? Mm. did you have a name for the uh no, we never got around to having a name. Uh -huh. We made a record, but we haven't got a name for it. <laughs> did, you, did Was it released? Yeah. What was the name of it? It was called Made in Bedlam. I just wondered, maybe there's a copy up here. I don't know if Stefan's got any. Uh -huh. ah, okay. And that was back on um, Transatlantic again. Mm -hmm. After a pentangle used to record for uh, WEA, and then when the group was actually split up completely, you know, like the whole contract thing collapsed totally. And oh, that's right, I'd made a record in between this time as well for Warners, which they paid me for, but I've never seen or heard of it since then. Oh, really? Know? Yeah, so that one that's one that disappeared in the meantime. <laughs> you know? Yeah. This is between uh, Pentangle and a Maiden Bedlam. Yeah. You made it. Mm. Okay. And that's right, because Kesh played on those tapes. Mm. And what? Tony. And Sue, I think. Mm. What came after a Maiden Bedlam? Um, well, these are the like the last things that have, that have been recorded. Mm -hmm. I did a solo album as well that, that came out slightly before a Maiden Bedlam, just of guitar pieces. What was the name? The Hermit, it was uh -huh. called. And um, I thought, really, because there was such a sort of complication at the end of the group splitting up and trying to like solve the problems with the record company and get get everything straight, uh -huh. I'd just, just start afresh and start with <laughs> some very simple, nice guitar tunes, you know. Yeah. So there's an album of that with uh, John James plays on them used to be a close neighbour. What's he uh, play? He's an acoustic guitar player. Mm -hmm. He actually records mainly for Stefan Kicking Mule. Mm -hmm. um, and a French guitar player, Dominique Trepo, is on it as well. Uh, how did you uh, hook up with Stefan in the, the new Kicking Mule album? Um, Which incidentally is very nice. Well, I knew Stefan straight from the time he first came over because he used to play at the Horseshoe Club and the Ben mm -hmm. was running it so I saw a fair amount of him in London in those days then he went to Rome then he came back again and um, exactly how we got together I'm not sure because I know I was I did a TV show with Barney Kessel was on it um, Julian Bream Jeff Beck and Paco Pena if you can imagine that lot <laughs> <laughs> on, a, on a TV show <laughs> and uh, I think I can't remember we were talking to Stefan about it and he, he'd said what about doing a duet album and uh, I think I waited till I got my group one finished and my solo one and then we just whisked in and did one you know when did you actually tape the album? Um, God, honestly I've got no idea last year sometime how did you like working with Stefan in the studio? Fine. Yeah. Actually, a lot, yeah. Yeah? Hmm. Do you find that your styles were just naturally compatible? Well, 
it was a little bit like working out tunes as I would work them out with birds, yeah. Or Stefan gave me some tapes of some things that he'd had which were finished ideas, which I listened to and then worked out just a complimentary guitar part along with them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and then a couple of the other things were combined efforts, you know. Well, I didn't find it any trouble at all. <laughs> I, I liked it, you know. Yeah. So, it's very straightforward music there as well, which is nice. No messing. Okay, I'd like to talk for a few minutes about uh, your style of playing, okay? Mm -hmm. If you could describe, like, your right hand technique. Mm, well, the, what technique I have got is based mainly on the the combination of trying to play folk stuff early on, Brunsy, and the couple of years I did classical playing, which conflicts slightly. <laughs> <laughs> but, I, you know, I just try and keep a hand up fairly high. You know, I don't use the technique of putting in the fingers down on the, on the body of the guitar or anything like that. Fingernails I use only slightly shorter than a classical player would. So it's a combination of flesh and fingernail, fairly high hand technique. And, uh, Which fingers do you use predominantly? Well, thumb and three fingers. But it's, it's essentially a, a sort of bodged classical technique, you know. Mm. For single line playing, I don't use a plectrum. I'd like to be able to play fast two finger runs, you know. Mm -hmm which I generally end up using a thumb and a finger or whatever <laughs> comes along, you know. Yeah. Let me flip this over. Okay. Would you tell me about your instruments? Mm -hmm. All the ones you have? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I was mainly playing the, the Gibson J50, and then that needed a refret and some work done to it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, while that was being done, I got a Guild D55. Um, both these guitars were second hand and had already been played in nicely and didn't need very much done <laughs> to them, you know. All the main work had been done. Um, what else? I did have a, a guitar made by Dick Knight. It's an English guitar maker. Um, that one's on the cover of a record called Pharaoh Annie. What, uh, where, what city is he out of? Um, is sort of like the Woking area, South London again. Mm -hmm. um, I think these are all acoustic guitars. Um, I recently got a second-hand Somitus. Somitus. Tony Somitus. Um, in fact, I got this from the same guy that Jackie used to play guitar with. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the Guild and the Gibson have been the ones I've used mainly. For playing and recording, um, I use light gauge strings, not bronze, the other ones. Steel? Steel, yeah. Hi. <laughs> um. And recently in Japan, I was given a guitar called a Katsai. Katsai. And it's, they're one of the many firms that do copy the Martin guitars. Mm -hmm. This is a copy of a, either an OM or a. 28, 28. What do you do you like it? It's in Lumberg's at the moment. <laughs> he's, he's making it playable, hopefully, you know. Because yeah. it's uh, it's beautifully made, but it's not set up for playing, you know. Yeah. Um what what about do you have do you still have your Irish harp or your sitar? Yeah, I still got the sitar. Do you still play with it? Um not not a great deal, no. But that's that's lapsed a bit. I ought to get that one out and play a bit more. How I think I actually don't play it mainly because Kesh is around. I think I'll have to feel I could play a bit better before we got involved in playing with him, you know. Did you what was uh how did you approach the sitar coming from a guitar? Um Well I did several bad things to it, like change the action and generally bodged it up to, <laughs> in order to make it playable, you know, mm -hmm. which is not considered very good. But I found that, you know, if I thought of it as being like a large dulcimer rather than anything else, you know, all sympathetic and drone strings and one melody line, which it is essentially, that I could just about get around playing 
you know, harmony second lines, you know, middle part harmony lines and things like that, which would fill out a group sound, you know. But I never got beyond that. I never got really to the stage of using mm. it as a, a solo instrument. Did you ever get a Windsor banjo? Yeah. Tell me about that. How do you know about that? Uh, I read uh, every back interview I could find that's ever been done on that. <laughs> See? I read every yeah. word that's been written about you. I still got that. Bert borrowed that. Mm -hmm. And after he borrows an instrument, it's never the same. He gets back <laughs> and it's ruined and it's, <laughs> it still is. <laughs> when did, how long ago did you get that? Oh, yes, right. I've had that for a long time. Mm -hmm. In fact, they're quite well thought of as banjos, aren't they? I don't mm -hmm. know much about banjos. Yeah, they are. Uh, what other instruments do you have? Any kind of out-of-the-way instruments? Do you have any dulcimers or things like that? Uh, I don't know, all sorts of things. Oboe, flute, concertina. Do you play all of these? Twelve-string filed. A couple of electric Gibsons. What kind of twelve-string filed is it? Cutaway. Same as Gordon Kiltrap's got. Do you know what make? Filed is the name of the guitar. Oh, F Y L D E. It's okay. Another English guy. St old Strat. Uh, Do you know the year? No, it's got a. Um, it's called Rosewood Neck. Not not a one piece neck. You know, an actual fingerboard on it. Small head, which dates it from somewhere, doesn't it? We have a guy that can date it. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever see the guitar yeah. book by Wheeler? Yeah. Yeah, he works right in the next office. Really? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, how long have you been playing the other instruments, like the oboe? Well, I, you know, I just have it in full room with it. John, what, what advice would you give to a, a, a young guitarist who uh, came to you and asked, you know, what can I do to play? You know, how should I approach it? Should I learn music? Should I take lessons? Hmm. Well, you really should do everything you possibly can. You know, if you're really interested, I think you 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 take lessons and learn, try and learn, read music, and you know, while you're not doing that, you're trying to copy things and generally copy other guitar players and copy records. You know, mm -hmm. the only advice I'd give would be, apart from trying to do it all. As, as so long, just so long as it's enjoyable to you, don't mm -hmm. sort of really force yourself to to do things. But is to play lots of music if you can that isn't actually written for the guitar. Don't never limit yourself to a music that's already been thought of as a set guitar piece. Try and play through old um, piano standards and loop music. Adapt them to the guitar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Even if it's impossible, try. You know, <laughs> and it's good for you, you know. Yeah. What do you uh, um, What do you do when you want to learn, uh, or what do you do to practice and to uh, engender you to help compose new songs? Well, I go through different periods. Sometimes I actually go down and run through scales and various finger exercises and tell myself it's time I went back and actually had some more lessons. That type of thing, mm -hmm. you know. It's a long time since I did have any proper lessons, but that if you do have time to do it, it's that is good, you know. Um, otherwise, the w the working out and transcribing of pieces that you actually like, although they're written for the lute, mm -hmm. isn't hard. That can be done mechanically any time, but the working on tunes of <laughs> of your own is can be quite tricky, you know. And there's mm -hmm. two or several different ways of doing it. Either if you do have an idea which you like, you actually don't stop playing until it's finished, which may take all day and, you know, just like, sit down and do it. With a tape recorder do you use? Well, actually, I just, to stop myself forgetting it, I scribble down rough music parts mm -hmm. as I go along, you know, which mm -hmm. is a, a fairly good way of doing it. Better, I think, than the tape, you know. Um, or the other thing is to, if you have several little bits which you think are good but you can't find where to take them to, just like store them, either jot them down and come back to them very quietly occasionally, like surprise yourself, play them and see if you can get a bit further with them. 
yeah, and yeah. just build up a store of phrases, which eventually, <laughs> if you're pushed into making a record, that some stage you can you can get out and use, you know. Uh -huh. You must have a whole book full. Well, I've got plenty of things that don't <laughs> go anywhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, one last question. Uh, there are two last questions. You said you had electric guitars. Mm -hmm. What what are besides the Stratocaster? Do you have? Yeah, well, an old. Um, it's a, it's not a Birdland. It's an old Gibson with a single cutaway. Mm -hmm. Es something or another. Okay. Uh, and I understand that you like to paint. I used to. Yes. That's Tell me. Uh, well, that's where I. Uh, that was my downfall going to art school to become a painter. If it wasn't doing for doing that, I wouldn't have been unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have had to make a living as a guitar player. You know? Oh, that's interesting. Mainly portraits, or uh, what subjects? Do you well, I, you know, I'm still interested in a lot of different styles. You know, mm -hmm. the the current favourite is a man called Rudolf Bresdan. He's a French. His his things were like lithographs, um, pre-impressionist, influenced the uh, Radon and the more obscure people at that time. You know. Mm -hmm. What do, you, do you have avocational interests aside from your guitar playing? Avocation meaning what? Um, what you're interested in aside from what you do to make a living. Oh, I see. Well, you know, since moving down to the country and doing the homegrown and the general, you know, that one, I got involved in doing a bit of mackerel fishing ah. and uh, then started to get interested in boats. And generally, the lifestyle now is geared towards, <laughs> you know, a little bit of guitar playing and a bit of fishing. And that kind of thing, you know. <laughs> That's great. Mm. Well, I think this should just about wrap it up. Good. John, thank you. I'm happy to report that John and I stayed in touch during the ensuing years. On occasion, he'd send me handwritten transcriptions of his own music and copies of old cheat music for parlor guitar pieces that demonstrated the origins of the Spanish and um, Sebastopol open tunings. The last time I heard from him, he sent me an email saying he was warming himself by the fire at his home in Hoyk in the Scottish borders. John passed away a few weeks later on March 25th, 2015. For more on British finger style guitar, be sure to check out my podcast with Bert Yanch. Before signing off, I want to thank my engineer and producer, Nick Hunt, for assembling this podcast. If you'd like to help support the Talking Guitar Project, hit that donate button. Thank you for listening.